When it comes to CPUs, two names dominate the conversation, Intel and AMD, the x86 powerhouses. In recent years, Apple and Qualcomm have thrown their hats in the ring with ARM-based chips shaking up the industry. But today, we're diving into something completely different, open, customizable, and potentially game-changing. Risk 5 This isn't just another processor, it's a whole new architecture, and it's the brains behind this motherboard from Deep Computing and Framework. So what exactly is RISC-V? In simple terms, it's a processor architecture, a set of instructions that tells a CPU how to process data, but here's the game changer. Unlike Intel's x86 or Apple's ARM, RISC-V is open source. That means anyone, companies, researchers, even hobbyists can use, modify, and build on it without paying licensing fees. To understand where RISC-V fits in, let's compare it to what we already know. x86, the foundation of Intel and AMD processors, is like an old, well-established language, rich, detailed, but weighed down by decades of legacy features. ARM, the architecture behind Apple's M-series chips and Qualcomm Snapdragon processors, is a leaner, more modern approach designed for efficiency. RISC-V takes that streamlined, efficient design, but removes the corporate gatekeeping. Instead of being locked into someone else's rules, companies and developers can customize it however they want, to a degree, there is a nonprofit governing body to manage and standardize the instruction set architecture to maintain compatibility and avoid overfragmentation. I mean, it sounds awesome, right? So why isn't RISC-V everywhere yet? Well, right now, most RISC-V chips live in embedded systems, microcontrollers, and very specialized hardware. As an electronics engineer, these are actually what I have the most experience with. High-performance desktop and laptop CPUs, like the one in this board, are still in their early days. The biggest challenge is software support. Almost everything we use, operating systems, applications, even basic web browsers, has been built with x86 and ARM in mind. That means RISC-V has some catching up to do. But with companies like Deep Computing Framework and even tech giants like Google and NVIDIA jumping on board, this could be the start of something big. So why put RISC-V in a framework laptop motherboard? Well, it's all about pushing towards fully open, modular, and customizable hardware. If you love to experiment, tinker, and explore the cutting edge of computing, this board gives you that opportunity. It's not replacing your Intel or Ryzen framework mainboard just yet, but it is a glimpse into a future where computers aren't just controlled by a handful of corporations. They're shaped by anyone with the drive to build something new. Now that we have a solid understanding of what RISC-V is, let's dive into this main board. While I did buy this board myself and will be sharing my thoughts, good or bad, this isn't necessarily a review, it's more of an overview because this isn't meant to be a mainstream, customer-ready, high-performance upgrade for the Framework 13. Instead, it's designed as a development board for RISC-V aimed at operating system kernel and software developers. My goal is just to introduce you to the main board, explain what it is, and more importantly, who it is and isn't for. We'll unbox it, see how it physically compares to a typical Framework mainboard, go over its specs and features, install it into the Framework 13, set up and explore the available operating systems, and take a look at its relative performance and capabilities. Now, the first thing to note as we take a look at the box, this is a third-party mainboard developed and produced by Deep Computing, a company based out of Hong Kong. While Deep Computing sells this board both as a standalone product and in bundled packages, I picked this one up directly from the Framework Marketplace and it shipped from their New Jersey facility. As far as the packaging, it's pretty much identical to what you'd get with an official framework mainboard. Simple, compact, and fully recyclable. But there's one key difference. Deep Computing manufactures this board in China, while Framework produces their mainboards in Taiwan. Other than that, at first glance, everything looks pretty familiar. 
Now, looking at the main board, while it follows the standard Framework 13 form factor, it's definitely a much simpler, more stripped down board. There's a standard CPU cooler assembly, which I assume was sourced directly from Framework. Underneath that, we should find the JH7110 RISC-V system on a chip, or SOC, which houses the CPU and other components. The CPU package is a quad-core 64-bit RISC-V Sci-5 U74 clocked at 1.5 gigahertz. The L1 cache is comprised of 32 kilobytes of instruction cache and an additional 32 kilobytes of data cache per core and a shared two megabytes of L2 cache. The SOC also includes a monitor core and a real-time control core. For graphics, it features an Imagination BXE-4-32 iGPU running at up to 600 megahertz. The key takeaway, this is not a high performance processor. In fact, it's the same SOC found in the Star 5 Vision 2, a sub $100 single board computer that performs somewhere between a Raspberry Pi 3 and a Raspberry Pi 4. Also under the cooler is eight gigabytes of LPDDR4X memory. Now this might seem counter to Framework's usual philosophy of upgradability, but while the SOC technically supports standard DDR4 SODIMM memory, using it would significantly limit the already limited performance. In this case, soldered LPDDR4X is actually the better choice. However, sticking to Framework's modular design approach, storage is technically socketed, but in a very different way. There's a micro SD card slot supporting up to 64 gigabyte cards and a second socket for an up to 64 gigabyte eMMC storage module. Unfortunately, I misunderstood the specs and assumed it came with an eMMC storage pre-installed, but it doesn't. I also don't have a compatible eMMC module on hand. And while the documentation lists tested micro SD cards, it doesn't mention compatible eMMC storage. So that's something I need to look into and follow up on. Now let's talk connectivity. The board has all the necessary connections for framework laptop components. There's an internal display connector, but it only supports the original 2556 by 1504 60 hertz display. It does not support the newer 2.8K panel. You've got the standard connectors for the webcam module, an M.2 slot for Wi-Fi compatible with these Wi-Fi modules, the touchpad connector, which also links the power button and fingerprint reader, which is supported and the keyboard, which works with the US international and British English keyboard layouts. There's the battery connection supporting the 55 watt hour framework battery, the speaker connector, and a connector for the audio board. As far as the ports, the two bottom USB-C connectors are standard USB 3.2 Gen 1, providing five gigabit per second data transfer speeds. The top left USB-C port is also USB 3.2 Gen 1, but with up to 60 watt power delivery. And the top right USB-C port is the most capable. It's a USB 3.2 Gen 1, also with 60 watt power delivery, but it's the only port that supports DisplayPort 1.4. That means it's the only one compatible with Framework's HDMI or DisplayPort expansion cards. Finally, there are three six pin ribbon cable connectors along the bottom edge of the board. I'm not entirely sure what they're for. My first guess was maybe serial connections, but after checking the documentation, it, the serial connection can be broken out through the USB, which I demo later if I can find my USB to serial adapter. So my second guess is GPIO. I know the DC Roma RISC-V laptops have a limited GPIO developer interface, but I haven't found any documentation confirming this for the framework main board. I'll reach out to Deep Computing and see if they can clarify. So that's the board, but before I installed it, I used my framework laptop to flash the operating system onto a brand new SD card. Just like most single board computers, this main board requires a pre-configured OS flash directly to storage. That's because it doesn't have a built-in BIOS or UFEI like traditional computers. Instead of independently detecting, initializing, booting from blank storage, it relies on a minimal bootloader that expects a specific OS structure on a specific storage device to proceed with the boot process. Deep Computing has done the initial development for versions of both Ubuntu and Fedora, providing pre-built images for each, 
Once downloading, flashing one of the images to an SD card is all it takes to get started. I decided to kick things off with Ubuntu, so let's check it out. Now, because it was already installed, I did test the 2.8K display, and while I did notice the backlight turn on, the display didn't work, so I swapped it out for the older display. 100% the original or the 2.8K display is not supported. So this hopefully will work. That look, there we go. Look at that. Bang, Ubuntu. Oh, I see trackpad working. Looks like we are in the Ubuntu desktop. Okay. Now I got to figure out how to get this set up for external capture so we can kind of take a look at the desktop together. Let me figure that out and I'll be right back. The first thing I discovered is this system only supports a single display. As soon as you plug in an external monitor, the laptop screen shuts off and the main display output defaults to the display port. That suggests the internal display connection and alternate display port signal over USB-C are probably shared with some kind of hardware switching happening behind the scenes. For most people, that won't be an issue, but for me, Whatever this hardware switching is doing, it's also messing with the pass-through on my capture card. That means I can only see my screen through OBS on my capture system, which makes things really awkward. I'm essentially looking at the display from one laptop on the screen of another laptop, and my brain just can't handle it. I've been instinctively trying to control the framework with my MacBook. So... Here's a quick look at Ubuntu on RISC-V. The installation is pretty minimal. There are some pre-installed packages, including LibreOffice, which probably isn't necessary on this build, but the basic development tools are there, so you can jump right in. First things first though, the Ubuntu image is only eight gigabytes, so you'll need to expand the partition to match your storage capacity, mostly because I wanted to test package installation. I installed Gparted and it found and installed it from the RISC-V repository, a quick partition expansion, and I was good to go. But here's where things start to get messy. Unlike Ubuntu on x86 or ARM, this version is very unstable. In fact, I broke it and had to reflash the SD card at least four or five times, just trying to update the system. Every time I ran a full upgrade, something broke. The first update upgraded the kernel, which bricked the OS, so I had to purge the kernels and hold the working 6.6 .6 kernel in place. Then the display manager broke, no login screen, no user authentication. Fixed that, only to realize I'd lost some hardware support, most notably Wi-Fi. Now, I know all of that sounds horrible, but honestly, I had fun. Troubleshooting problems, analyzing the cost, testing solutions, breaking things again, it's all part of the experience. And if that sounds like your kind of challenge, then this board might be for you. But if you just want to dive into RISC-V software, firmware, or OS development without fighting the OS itself, I'd recommend using the Fedora image instead. It feels much more stable. In fact, I've been running Fedora on this system for a few days now, and it's what I used for all my performance testing. And get this, I haven't broken it once. I flashed a new SD card, updated the system, and all the framework hardware works, though not all of it works optimally. Now, I haven't done any actual coding on this board yet because, let's be real, I'm a content creator, well, actually a full-time dad and husband first, a content creator second, and a developer, that's probably like 29th on the list, but I did run some development-focused tests. First, I pulled out an old Raspberry Pi 3B and compared it to the deep computing mainboard. I ran a simple core mark test to measure integer processing performance and the framework mainboard beat the Pi 3 by about 17%. So as expected, performance lands somewhere between the Raspberry Pi 3 and Pi 4, but definitely closer to the three. For real world test, I ran a timed Linux kernel build, compiling a default build of kernel 6.8, took about an hour and three minutes. To put that into perspective, for those not familiar with Linux development, my B-Link EQ14 with a quad-core N100 CPU at 3.6 gigahertz does the same job in about eight and a half minutes. My Ryzen 5700X 3D-based Linux desktop 
about two minutes. But by the way, if you're interested in high performance Linux builds, my full system build video should be up on my Lifting Linux channel around the same time as this video goes live. So check that out, link in the description. And for those who wanna dig deeper into the board performance, I've also linked test reports from a few other development focused benchmarks I was able to run. I was limited by time and well, dependency compatibility. So I couldn't run the full suite, but those should give you a solid idea of what to expect. Now, at the end of the day, I really like the deep computing RISC-V mainboard. It aligns with the same goal that framework and much of the open source community share, pushing for truly free and open source hardware and software. As a tool for RISC-V development, it's okay, not groundbreaking, but respectable. And I absolutely appreciate that deep computing took time, effort, and financial risk to create the first ever third-party mainboard for the framework chassis. That's a huge step for both framework and the broader open source development community. But of course, it's not perfect. The biggest downside has to be the price. I get that economy of scale plays a big role here. This was probably a low volume manufacturing run, which drives up cost. But at $200, it's a tough sell when like the Vision 5.2, which has essentially identical specs, costs half as much and when you consider that deep computing sells a complete dc roma laptop with the same jh7110 soc for just 300 dollars, it puts things into perspective for this price i really would have loved to see the deep computing use the eight core two gigahertz risk 5 soc from their dc roma laptop 2 it would have made for a much more capable development experience for example, one project I'd love to take on with this board is backporting hardware support into the RISC-V Arch project, but there's no way I'm doing that work bare metal. That's a ton of kernel patching and at over an hour per compile, no thanks. More than likely, I'll spin up a QMU VM on my server, do the work there, and then test and debug on the main board. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing this project because I'm not. I love what deep computing has done here. In fact, I've already talked to two of my friends who are actual devs and both framework owners into picking one up. I just think it's important to provide the full context. While it is a really cool board, it's still a $200 main board with a two and a half year SOC that performs about the same as a nine year old Raspberry Pi. That said, if you're a RISC-V enthusiast, a developer looking to experiment with a modular laptop platform, or just someone who loves tinkering with open hardware, this board is an exciting step forward. Hopefully, this is just the beginning and we'll see more powerful, optimized RISC-V options for framework laptops in the future. But for now, I think it's a great proof of concept and I'm excited to see where it leads. So. That's my take on the deep computing RISC-V mainboard for the Framework 13. It's definitely an exciting step for open source hardware, but I want to hear from you, especially the RISC-V developers out there. If you've picked up this board, what projects do you have planned for it? Are you using it for kernel development, OS experimentation, or something else entirely? Drop a comment below and let's talk about it. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. And if you want to see more deep dives into open hardware, make sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.